and good evening again. This is Stumbling Radio, Saturday night edition. We have a very interesting show this evening and a very important guest, Mr. Julian Lee. Mr. Lee, welcome to the show. Hello, Paul. How are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, for those of our listeners who haven't read your, your excellent autobiography, My Realizations, could you uh, talk a little bit about your background? Okay, well, uh, I grew up in Des Moines, Des Moines, Iowa. My birth name was Curtis Lee McCunis, which is a Lithuanian name, which I changed later for business reasons, because I was tired of spelling it all the time. And I was from a family of six children and a Catholic family. Grew up in Catholic school. Got interested in music when I was in my teens, strongly. And then later, soon after that, got more interested in religion and spiritual subjects and ultimate questions. Uh, later on, I kind of deluded by propaganda. I joined the Baha'i faith until I saw through that. Ended up with a family, children, grew, continued in my spiritual searches and questing and finally got into my 40s and became very concerned about the survival of the white European people as well as their moral regeneration and hoping possibly to make a contribution to making Christianity interesting to them again. And that's about it. And... Uh Basically, uh, I became in familiar with uh, your work through your very interesting website, which I highly recommend, which is uh, celibacy.info. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people have uh, find the word celibacy, as you told me, to have uh, some negative connotations. And you've told me uh, you prefer the word uh, continence. Uh, and also moral self-mastery. Why do you think uh, this um, term and this uh, the subject of the self-discipline has become almost unknown in the U.S.? Well, as I said, Paul, I think I would have just as soon had the domain chastity.com or .info or something, but it was already taken by some book character for girls or something. But anyway, celibacy implies lifetime vows often or monastic vows and has religious connotations but on the other hand no man is celibate his whole life and self-control really consists of periods of perfect celibacy whether it's for a day or a week or a month you know so moral self-control really involves a man learning how to be chaste so it's a good enough domain for us, but we deal with all levels of self-control, whether it's just you want to get off of sex addiction or a porn addiction or just get stronger from continence or have a religious and spiritual quest towards as much chastity as you can manage. We inspire the whole renunciation and self-control impulse. And uh, once again, I, I, as I said, I had to teach my Microsoft Word program the word check continents because it said it didn't exist um, as far <laughs> as Microsoft Word was concerned. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. we talk about master builders and master artisans, and the word seems to have lost its meaning to gain a to gain control or to gain a, to gain. A, sort of, uh, of uh, perfection of something or at something, but yet we have lost the ability to basically just have a, our, our own strength within and be, you know, um, uh, individual, individually have an in a strong interior as it was. And right. it seems as though it's come from a lack of meditation how how did you um how do you see meditation playing a role in gaining inner strength 
meditation is probably in the end the only way that a man can truly master lust and become chaste. And so it's very key. And meditation uh, gives life improvements in all kinds of areas. But if a fellow wants to get over sex addiction, sex is the biggest addiction. Many sages and spiritual teachers have said so. Buddha said lust is the strongest passion and the strongest addiction. And You need to have something pretty sublime and pretty pleasant you have to have a higher bliss to really break the sex addiction, and meditation helps with that. Mm-hmm. And how, uh, when I started meditating, I would basically go up on the roof of my house at night and just, you know, uh, close my eyes for t- for ten minute intervals and open them and look at the stars for ten minute intervals and close my eyes again, and that was kind of my uninformed entry into meditation. How would you? advise a novice t- uh, to begin their quest into spiritual meditation. Well, one thing to realize, Paul, is that everybody uses the faculty of concentration all the time in their everyday life, in their studies, in their work. You have to use the faculty of concentration to attain anything mentally or in life. And concentration is the first basic uh, component of meditation. And if you see a fellow working, concentrating on a, a problem, a machine, a math problem, some conundrum of the mind, you'll see that he actually starts to show qualities that yogis get when they meditate. His breath will slow down, you know, because the more quiet the mind, the less the mind is moving, the more one-pointed the mind, the less you breathe. That's one of the secrets, by the way, of pranayama, in that if you can take it the other way, the other direction, and slow down your breath or quiet your breath, it also quiets the mind. But first of all, realizing there's nothing really esoteric or foreign about meditation. We do it all the time to accomplish things in life. Uh, then go for a good technique that appeals to you. Most men will try a number of techniques over time. You talked about one that you came into on your own. There's an ancient scripture from India called the Vijnana Bhairava that lists something like around 100 meditation techniques. One of those was concentrating on the joy you feel when you meet an old friend that you like that you haven't seen for a long time. That's actually one of the meditation techniques in the Vijnana Bhairava, which supposedly was spoken by Shiva himself, actually. But there are many, many meditation techniques, but they'll all involve concentrating on an object, which the Hindus call an alambra, or something to hold on to. Just says the elephant keeper, when he tries to walk through the market square with his elephant, gives it a stick to hold in its trunk, we give ourselves a mantra or some other meditation object or the Christians in their rosary and the prayers of Christianity. This is the alambra that we make our mind hold on to. It's a very simple principle, really. Okay, and so um, that would lead it nicely into my next question. You've spoken of how Christianity, which is currently quite spiritually deficient, can be revitalized by the uh, yoga and other um, uh, Eastern uh, methods of spirituality. Can you uh, briefly discuss that? You've talked about Christ being uh, a guru, which uh, Christians should adhere to more closely than they do. And it seems Christian has be- Christianity has become an entirely materialistic faith. So can you go into... Um, this revitalization process of it. All right, Paul. Well, that's a big subject. First of all, I I wouldn't say that spirit that uh, Christianity is spiritually deficient. The traditions of Christianity are spiritually very very rich. It's just that. Well, I mean, modern Christianity as it is today. Yeah. Right. I also wouldn't say it's materialistic either. But yeah, it's become 
that way, it seems, in expression. But basically, I grew up Christian, and I grew up Catholic, and yet little was explained to me about the, the things in my own faith that I found to be very important later. And I, because I didn't have good answers for a young man's mind, which needs so many different kinds of answers and mental food, I went searching. What is true? Why are there so many religions? How do I know this is the truest? What is the truest? What is important in my own religion? And so by studying other religions, I started to get insight into what really was important in Christianity and Catholicism. It's sort of like if you want to know all about cameras, and you don't know what the parts are, what they mean, what they do, it's really good to look at a lot of different cameras, old ones and antique ones and new ones, and you start to know what the essential elements of a camera are. And I came to the conclusion that chastity, moral self-control, was always essential in Christianity. But, you know, I went to Catholic school for eight years. Nobody said a word about it. No priest, no nun. I came to the conclusion that concentration of the mind and meditation was what the Christian saints did that helped them connect with God and feel the bliss of God and rapture and ecstasy of the saints. And yet nothing was ever taught to me in Christianity about concentration of the mind. So I studied other faiths to try to understand what was of greatest value in Christianity. So essentially uh, what we have is a, a certain amount of what Christianity has lost and it can regain uh, through study of these interconnected faiths. Right. For example, in yoga and Hinduism, they say that bhakti yoga is the highest path to God. Back to yoga is just cultivating the attitude of devotion towards God, often directed at whatever whatever his symbol is or whatever the personage is or the, the uh, embodiment of God that can be the guru or even just an idea or a Shiva. Anyway, they say back to yoga is higher than all the other paths. Well, they also say Christianity is basically back to yoga, that it really stresses the devotional attitude, not rational, not logical, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, a focus on the founder. Well, to the Hindus, that's guru. And if Christians would take the attitude Hindus often have towards guru, the devotional attitude, they'd be upgrading their devotional attitude towards Christ, really. Just learning about bhakti yogi, yoga. So, yes, it helped me to identify that this bhakti, this attitude of reverence, just teaching a child the little mudra, putting your hands together, which focuses you and expresses devotion, so lucky as a little boy just to see holy cards of these mudras, putting the hand together and getting in that devotional attitude, and yet nobody ever explained what that's for or what that does or how it puts you in a devotional attitude. So study of the other religions to me helps assay out what's really essential in Christianity and what makes saints and what makes what can make spiritual uh, Christianity revivified and potent and effective and attractive again. And I first was introduced to, as a lot of um, young men are these days, to yoga and the idea that Eastern traditions have a lot to teach us about Western tradition in general by the works of Julius Evola. What's your, what are your views on Evola and his uh, Yoga of Power book? You know, I have to first say, Paul, I haven't read Julius Evola. I've just poked around at a few, a few paragraphs and sentences of his, so I can't really say with much authority I will say that what I did read on his commentaries about the Bhagavad Gita were pretty shallow, and he didn't really understand the Bhagavad Gita, in my opinion. I've been okay. studying that book for about 30 years. I have about 40 different translations of it, and I don't think Evola penetrated that book very much. Okay. And, Not putting him down. Uh, I'm sure he said yeah, some great things. Yeah, yeah, I just want your, you know, your honest opinion. That's, uh, if we take a specific, you know, tell me what Evola says, and then I'll... Respond yeah. to that, perhaps. Well, I'm not really terribly familiar with him. I just was throwing the name out. I'm going to throw another name out. That's Alan Watts. I know a lot of uh -huh. folks are familiar with. And what are your kind of general impressions of his work? Alan Watts was like a pundit. A pundit 
is a person who knows a lot of lore, knows a lot of uh, ideas. He can talk about a religion entertainingly, but he may not be realized very much in that religion. In India, they have that big difference. There's a big difference between a pundit who might know all kinds of scriptures, and he might know all kinds of lore, and then the sadguru who knows God and can help you know God. The pundit, they say, oh, Ramdas, he was a pundit. You get to be a little half-baked pundit by going over to India or whatever, and all of a sudden you come back here and they elevate you to guru, you know, because you can talk and entertain. Well, Alan Watts was that for Buddhism. He had a reputation for being a bohemian, for being a, you know, having a lot of women, lovers. Well, this is not Buddhism. So he wasn't an ascetic, so he can't really be a Buddhist. He was just an entertaining talker. And I found everybody into Alan Watts and goes to Zen Buddhism through Alan Watts. They think there's no moral component. They think there's no chastity necessary. So they have a dead religion. Okay. And <laughs> as I said, uh, to begin with, uh, let's uh, deal with the, dealing with the... That, I, I, I'm having a little trouble pronouncing this book here, this scripture, Bhag, Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I've r- read the word many times. I've never said it out loud. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, how would you uh, advise uh, a new a person new to this to approach this this work as a sacred scripture? First of all, don't settle for one translation. They're not all equal. You don't get a sense of what it's really saying until you've read five or ten. Uh, a lot of translations water things down or remove technical language or try to make it comfortable and pleasant to Westerners or even corrupt Westerners. The women tend to translate it differently than the men. You know, So look at a lot of translations. There, there's a translation by Juan Mascaro that's very popular. Everybody who gets interested in the Gita gets that one. It's Penguin Classics, I think. Well, it's very, very watered down. Uh, It'll use the word discipline instead of yoga. It'll use the word uh, just watered down words and leave out the technical language. So get a lot of translations, first of all. Okay. And uh, uh, kind of in perusing this work, what uh, what significance do we draw from the actual positions? Because we know most people just do yoga to feel good. Uh, what is the actual significance of the of the positions? Well, yoga is not about the body; it's about the mind and the the soul, which Hindus call the jiva, the individual consciousness. Yoga has never been about the body. Another book I've collected for many years is the Yoga Sutras. Well, it's the master book on yoga. It is the authoritative book on yoga. It's called the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. I have oh, 25 or so of those. Well, it mentions body postures one time. After talking about different meditation techniques, it says the spine should be erect and settled when meditating. And that's the only thing it says about the body. And all the rest are administrations to the mind. And it says yoga is, the activity of yoga is austerities, devotion to the Lord, and scriptural study. That's one of the yoga sutras, the first one, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Yoga is, the activity of yoga is, austerities, devotion to the Lord, and scriptural study. Now, you walk into a yoga studio and say that to all the women in there who are trying to get smaller butts or prettier butts or whatever to get a boyfriend. They don't want to hear it. That's not yoga, what they're doing. Another interesting thing is when you're touched by the Holy Spirit through seeking God within, through trying to thin the mind and get the mind out of the way, one of the emanations, manifestations of the Holy Spirit is movements of the body the Shakers went through it. They got called Shakers for that. The Quakers went through it. The early Christians went through it. It's a manifestation of the Kundalini. Well, guess what? You go into all the old mudras and postures and asanas spontaneously when that happens. And that's actually where those were, where those were learned by the people in the East 
from this phenomenon of spontaneous movements. Now, who does this happen to? Pure men who are chaste and seeking God. So you can see how far the yoga studios are from yoga. Mm -hmm. And this uh, corruption of yoga, which you've written about uh, also in your... Uh your autobiography, My Realizations, which for our listeners is available at uh, myrealizations.com. Yes. And uh, you've talked about the, uh, basically, the, uh, this, I guess it's debasement of yoga, and uh, how, how did this happen? Basically, can I just ask, how did it happen? <laughs> well, okay, first of all, Mankind in the West slid into a lot of materialism and externalism and got alienated and distanced from his own yoga, the yoga of European peoples, which is Christianity. And by the way, all the best, highest yoga is right there in Christianity, the true yoga. So we had people in the West becoming more material, and then someone goes over there, it started with men, actually. They come over and they bring back Hatha. Hatha is some of the bodily subspecialties of yoga that involves some knowledge of these uh, postures. And they say, oh, this is associated with this health, and this is associated with that health. In reality, these postures that happen spontaneously purify the body. Yoga destroys all health problems on its own. And later, these postures became associated with particular health benefits, although they may be or not, depending on what's really happening in your yoga. But... They came over here and said, oh, here's this posture. It's called this. It, this is called the Jalandhara Bandha. This is called the uh, uh, Pranayama, the sit, sit, Sitkari Pranayama, and da-da-da. Do these. And so this was sold to women who are body conscious and care more about their bodies. So basically women got interested in yoga because of its misrepresented physical focus, real yoga, renunciation, chastity, seeking God within. This is a male enterprise. That's why it's men who created yoga. And that's why yoga can never be the same once it becomes the province of women, unfortunately. I'm not putting down women, but I've never met one who really wants to sit there and meditate or do austerities. In fact, it's anathema to them. The whole thing of holding postures, sitting, for a posture. In the Yoga Sutras, it says a posture is mastered when it's held perfectly for three hours. You know what? Those are austerities. The postures are intended to be painful and make you beyond the pairs of opposites, beyond pain and pleasure, beyond heat and cold. So you can see it's all misunderstood now. Okay. Uh, as far as going into the, the subject of... Um of yoga a little more for, uh, or rather, uh, to pursue one strain of which you say is Christianity is the yoga of Europeans. Uh, what do you see as the fundamental step uh, American Europeans have to take to regain the spirituality individually? Number one, remember why the early Christians and the priests were chaste. It's the most difficult attainment for a male, and you don't do it without motivation or a reason. And it's right there in early Christianity in the words of Christ himself when he says, there are eunuchs who are born that way, some made that way by men, and there are eunuchs, that is sexless, chaste, pure, who are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And then in another verse he says, the kingdom of heaven is within us. So he was giving it away. Oh, he also said, this is a hard statement, however, and few can bear it, few can handle it. It was true then, it's true now too. But the really avid God-seekers, the avid Christians, the apostles, the priests, they wanted to know that. So chastity is the foundation of religious knowledge. And then for the laity, for the non-priests, they need to have a lesser form of chastity, but it's highly significant in the development of religious knowledge as well as the protection and development of a positive culture. So that's number one, rediscovering their moral core. Number two, realizing the significance of devotion, the devotional attitude towards Christ. 
that will regenerate Christianity and make it powerful and beautiful again. Okay. Uh, we, we have a question from Copperhead in the chat room. He asks, how, do you, how does one square the life of an A-state with the struggle to defend the European nation from its enemies? Reconcile the what? What was the first part? Uh, reconcile the life of the ace state with the struggle to defend the European nation from its enemies. What's what's the A state? Uh, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. A state, uh, as in A E S T H E. I guess so. Yeah. Of an ascetic. Yeah. Well, men are never fighters if they can't be ascetic. You know what? One of the most powerful forms of ascetic is it's a fighter a warrior is an ascetic listen if you can't develop any asceticism you're not going to protect your people in any way shape or form yeah and i've uh just kind of tied into this because i was going to bring this up i wanted to uh basically uh enlist your views also on the question of these uh well, you had these warrior monastic orders in the in the past in the in the medieval times. Uh, with the situation as it is today for young men, do you see that it might be advantageous to to young men to uh, form themselves into these orders and live and work and study together and just uh, live apart in this manner? It probably is not going to be precisely Catholic, but um, do you see an advantage for for uh, the younger generation in this way to, to separate themselves in this manner? Of course, of course. Sign of a healthy culture and spiritually and emotionally healthy men is brotherhoods, various kinds of orders. But you know what's even more basic? Friendship. Friendship. First thing that goes when you become degenerate and morally corrupt is you stop having male friends. You draw away from them and you relate only to women and always with a sexual charge. So one thing that happens to men who get moral self-mastery is they like male friends again, just like you did when you were a kid. Oh, they're cool. I respect them. You see how they're different, you know. And you make friendships again. So that's the root of everything. And... uh when men can't make friends or know each other personally and live together and form various forms of community, there's something morally wrong with them. So that's the start there, friendship. From that can, can come brotherhoods and different monastic orders and stuff. But back to the question about asceticism. You know, first thing that happens to a guy who stops bleeding, hemorrhaging his life force, is he gets nerve, and he gets courage, and he gets fearlessness, and he gets energy. Now, you think you don't need that to fight for your people? Well, it seems to me quite often, and perhaps you have some input on this, that uh, young men today are pressed into a corner, frankly, and kind of uh, imprisoned within themselves, and they seek release. By uh, by this form of um, expending their essences uh, because of their their sort of being caged internally, and as you say, one means of this is to seek friendship once again and to just live again and try to have uh, you know try to have a life. But how do you see um, what what escape is there from that box? We've talked about meditation. And uh, you've also recommended f friendship. The only escape is getting off the porn, getting off the masturbation, and regenerating yourself. And only that will regenerate you and your mind and your friendships and your culture and your people. Mm -hmm. Renouncing the porn, renouncing the bleeding, becoming strong but, again. Yeah, though it's like as if they, uh, to be more clear, it's like they are basically live in this box or forced fed uh the sexuality which is all around us on billboards on tv on even the radio uh it's like there is no escape for it 
for a urban male? Well, the first thing they need, of course, is a clue. They need somebody to tell them. Mm-hmm. Something that I was amazed I never heard. A guy, an older man, or even a priest just telling me the deal about morality, how we're supposed to resist, save ourselves, save our inner spirit. And uh, that's the first thing that goes with the creative losses, the inner spirit, the sense of fullness, the sense of motivation, the sense of confidence. So we need some men around here and there somewhere telling the truth to young men about their true sexual nature and their true potential, which comes from continents. And I don't see an overabundance of moralists running amok. I see an overabundance of pornographers calling to the young men everywhere. We live in the porn age. And uh, one of your uh, one of your activisms has been uh, uh, taking Frank to the streets openly and opposing this uh, this uh, uh, pornocracy, as someone has uh, aptly termed it. Termed it. And uh, there is a video, I believe, of of your efforts that you made, which is available for our listeners at uh, youtube.com slash divinefellowship. With all these people uh, who, you know, pretty much ignored your message, do you see any further opportunity for them, for these uh, people, or do you, um, because frankly, when you see a, a person reject, you know, inner, or any sense of discipline or any sense of, the inner human being, it seems that they become less than human. Do you think there's uh, a chance for regeneration for them, or are they permanently, basically, uh, subhumans? Nobody's ever a subhuman, Paul. My regaling those folks and uh, hectoring them a bit was not so much about them personally, I think some of them will be pricked in their conscience a little bit, maybe think it over a little bit, you know. But it was more to make a statement generally, especially to these uh, corruptors, Stephen William Humphrey and Tim Keck of The Stranger up in Seattle in the Portland Mercury here in Portland who were destroying this city with things like an amateur porn festival. Now, I don't... I'm not an activist for things like that. I simply respond when I encounter things. And they put this up and they're all of a sudden promoting this movie right on my block, a a half block away from me. And it made me sick and disgusted me. So the night it was due, I just penned a little song and went out there and sang it to them. Brought my camera, as I always do, but I'm not going back there because it's too disgusting and depressing. You know, But it was my reaction to an event on my street. I'm not going to keep going around to where these people are because they disgust me and depress me. Okay. As far as those people, well, I'm hoping that the people who watch the movie, the little video called Porn Press Protest, can think about it. Is it really good to go support porn festivals? I tried to pick conscience there, including the men who created this garbage. Okay. Well, uh, to move along... Again, uh, we can cover some more ground here. <clears throat> sure. You've uh, create you re- referenced pornographers just now, and another one of your sites, which is one of your most interesting sites among others, is JewishFaces.com. Yes. And you've collected a, a enormous number of photos of uh, uh, Jewish um, people of Jewish extraction who are uh, among the main uh numbers of those who are proje- who are projected at us every day in other words actors musicians and uh people in the press and media and business and also literature but also the people who are behind them uh the people who are behind actors people who are behind pornography uh these people are trying to essentially create new standards and subject these people to their uh, their these standards against their will, and basically your your site very clearly establishes this fact. So, what do you see as the next step that must be taken on this question? 
we're still in the step that we have to break the no-talk rule. That site, jewishfaces.com, is to give a wake-up call to white European Gentiles to teach them how much power you can get when you can manipulate people psychologically and create a no-talk rule around yourself by being the world's big victims, etc. You can become invisible. It's to let them know that Jews network. They ethnically network, but they tell us we shouldn't and can't and it's wrong. And that website lets us see, along with so many others out there, how powerful they have become because of their network and because of their no-talk rule which places them beyond criticism in the minds of Gentiles who are easily manipulated by the whole Holocaust narrative and the white guilt the Jews pump out to them all the time. So the step is to keep talking, keep talking, like Kevin MacDonald is doing and so many others, breaking the rule, not being afraid to break the rule. You know what happens if you have a no-talk rule around your you become invisible, you can do what you like, you're always uncriticized. Well, you know what that does? It corrupts you. If you look at that uh, website, you can see these people are becoming corrupted by never receiving any criticism. Hey, talk about the Jews for their own good. Got it? <laughs> well, uh, I certainly agree that the, the po there's a great power in imagery and... Uh this greater power and imagery than, you know, just uh, even speaking about it. And this is what you've basically done there is just to put forth uh, imagery instead of mere words or to back up your words, rather, with this vast array of imagery. Uh, and uh, you've, uh, you've done this also in your artistic creations, uh, with uh, particularly with your uh, song, Hymn for Dresden, we're going to go into your music in a moment, but I want to uh, uh, briefly uh, inform our l listeners about uh, this uh, um, your music in general, which they can find at RebWest.com. Yes. And I'm going to play a clip from him for Dresden, but I highly re recommend that our listeners uh, view this video on YouTube. It's him for Dresden, comma. Uh, view count suppressed, which it evidently has been, uh, and it has some very stark imagery behind the song. I'm going to play the uh, song clip here now, and we'll go into your music a bit. Okay. of my life and 
I was affected, like all of us at that age, in the early 60s by the Beatles and so on. And uh, around the age of 12, 13, just like most young men do, I wanted to do something significant and important and uh, thought songwriters and musicians and rock stars were the ones who were important and that they got to say something, you know, and so on. So I got an aspiration starting around 13 just to be a songwriter musician. First melody I wrote became Anthem for the Men of the West, which I also sent you. You can hear also at the website, RevWest.com. And so from about 13 to 21, I was strongly motivated to write songs. I found it very difficult to write songs, but that's what I wanted to do. And what was your what was the first instrument you took up? My mother got me an acoustic guitar, a six-string Lyle acoustic guitar one Christmas, and I muddled about on that, started teaching myself to play it. We also had a grand piano in the living room, and I banged around on that for many years and taught myself to play the piano pretty well. Mm-hmm. I, I notice uh, one thing about your music is that the bass, or uh, the bass line, is very, um, very strong. Uh, unlike uh, most uh, contemporary or popular music, which seems to uh, kind of uh, mute or even kind of obscure the bass. Is that, uh, a, is that a particular keynote of your of your music? Well, I'm delighted, Paul. Thanks for noticing that. I really care about the bass line. I love writing the bass line. I care about it. I feel like if all you have is a vocal and a bass, not even guitar, not even a keyboard, that you should be able to get the song and the sense of the song. And so every note that I play in the bass is just discreet. It's just so. It's not a throwaway or just a random filler. It's always this one and not the other one. I love writing bass parts. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. on this CD, uh, which you have, it's Songs for Europeans, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, you actually play all the instrumentation. Yes, I do. Okay. And uh, say so a uh, bass, cello, and drum programming and vocals. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you uh, sometime in the future plan to put on a, put out a second CD? Well, I I've got enough for a full album, Paul. I don't know if I'll ever have more than that. You know, I'm an old man. I'm 53. Probably in five years, I won't sound good singing anymore. I'll probably be all creaky, creaky voice. I don't know. I hope I can finish. I still have a few songs I want to get done, two or three. Don't know if I'll make it. Well, we uh, certainly, I was quite, um, to be honest, uh, taken aback at the artistry. I'm not a hugely into music, but that kind of leads into my second question about uh, the uh, the spirituality or spiritual effects of music. Can you talk a little bit about that? Indeed. Sp- uh, music can either elevate the spirit and lift the morals and the vision, or it can cast the mind down into the mud and fill you with negativity. And the hardest thing about writing songs when I was young, was I felt like I didn't know anything, and I always felt my lyrics were stupid, you know. So Hymn for Dresden started off as a different song, completely with different lyrics. I went through like three or four sets of lyrics, and it wasn't until I was in my 40s and 50s that I felt like I knew anything important worth saying. And I think if you have a beautiful melody or an original melody or a good song, it's a shame when it just says something trite or rubbish, you know. All those Beatles songs are kind of a shame because most of the lyrics are just rubbish that don't tell you anything or bond the community or talk about eternal values. So I'm glad that I really didn't do my music until my 50s and I had some things I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically I've just really recently come to appreciate the power of singing in general as a way of connecting oneself with uh, uh, higher powers, as it were. Uh-huh. I uh, 
I uh, recently had an experience working with uh, young f- young folks who, you know, really are not really keen about being in the, in church 14 to 19, and yeah. uh, so I had them sing uh, as a choir in between services. Otherwise, they'd just be seen sitting back back there in the in the pews, and uh, they were. I uh, had them sing some old hymns in between the services, and they were just uh, kind of transported it. And they actually uh, were so proud. They talk about it on their Facebook uh, pages right now. So I was quite Im- impressed with that. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how singing can uh, basically uh, how it ties in with meditation, if 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 you believe it does, or you know, what, well, it's what, major. What Nothing awakens devotion better than singing to God. And our ancestors, you know, people leave Christianity and flee towards all these Eastern things and yoga. The other day, sometime back, I was at this Jayu Tall conference and all these Westerners and white people were singing all these bhajans about uh, Hanumad the monkey god in a foreign language, you know. And I thought, how sad. All their ancestors sang bhajans too in the church with words that they could understand, blissful, joyful words to God. And these people have to do it in a foreign language, you know. But they still are hungry. They still want to sing to God and touch that spirituality. So our churches, our Christian tradition is full of bhajans, full of devotional songs. And you can get so much joy and feel God from singing those in church robustly and sincerely. Of course, the young people, you know, the mind that gets bored. They want what's different and new and edgy and aggressive, you know. So the hymns of church sort of bore them. They just have to mature a little bit beyond that. Well, the interesting thing... But indeed, thing singing in, this, in church is fundamental. Yeah. In this case, they would, there's so much um, New Age uh, hymns sung these days in the churches that they were quite... Um, that these old hymns like the the old rugged cross and amazing grace seemed quite uh, uh, new to them, actually. That was part of... Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. The but, Christian uh, heritage is loaded. Go ahead. The Christian heritage is loaded with amazing music and amazing songs. It's a priceless legacy we have. I love going into church and hearing them sing and watching the chorus, the, the choir come in and their pageantry and all the people singing. It's very moving. I get great bhakti from that. And the words about God's munificence and and grace and love, love it. Uh, Transports you. you. Yeah, it's, it's quite moving. And as I say, I've only recently kind of come to appreciate it after many years in church. But... Uh, you, you mentioned something very interesting in that uh, people are trying to find uh, their uh, their spirituality unique to, or Europeans rather, are trying to find spirituality in other cultures when they have so much in their own. And we see a lot of this in people journeying to holy spots around the world uh, and ignoring their own uh, places where there's potentiality for uh, for uh, kind of holiness or higher uh, meditation or higher uh, uh, acclimatization to spirituality. So what are some regions or areas um, in the West that you see um, or consider to or do you see certain regions in the in the West that are more spiritual than others? I don't believe that. I don't believe there are certain places where there's more spirituality. I think uh, the spiritual place is wherever the sage dwells, where the, wherever the God seeker lives, wherever the man is pursuing chastity and cultivating his God devotion and God quest, that's where the spiritual place is. India and the Lord, these are all within. You don't have to go anywhere for them. You have to go within. Okay. 
And uh, I'm going to play a bit of the Ancestor song for our listeners. And then uh, in the few minutes we have remaining, go a little bit into your background in astrology. Okay. I remember when you were my One thing I know and sure that there is grace You will know it like I do Though I leave you with the world Okay, once again you can find the remainder of that song and get a CD on RevWest.com uh, Basically, uh, your profession is in... Um, Astrology, Mr. Lee, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you got into that and how, uh, uh, just talk a little bit about that? Sure. Probably before I do, I should say, Paul, I don't see a conflict between that and Christianity from a deeper view, although I think it's also something most people shouldn't mess around with much or know much about. The Bible in Genesis says the Creator put the lights in the sky, the greater light and the lesser lights and other lights which meant planets, to be as signs for men. And then the Satguru of Europe, Jesus Christ, was found using astrology by the astrologers of Persia where astrology was a high art. And the first ones to ever honor Christ were astrologers using astrology to find him. Probably they're the only ones who ever honored him properly. So I don't see a conflict. Astrology is the study of God's laws. God didn't make a random, chaotic world. He has natural laws spread all through the creation. And nobody who hasn't studied the universal cohesion that astrology lays bare can be said to have been properly awed by the Creator. So astrology has only made me more in awe of God and made me feel I need God all the more. Because if you're a good astrologer, you see how you are caught in these laws, these karmic laws and these limits. And you want grace, you want grace, you want grace more and more. So astrology has made me look more for God's grace. And I got into it just because I saw it worked. I saw there was truth in it. If you watch Mars square your moon five times, you know, write the journal on it, study it, it, goes over a period of a few days, you'll see, wow, certain things happen. You get in fights. Your wife yells at you, throws a pot at you. <laughs> you have a little scrape. You have a Mars square moon phenomena. Whenever something happens, there's always the right transits there for it. So, I was just amazed by how it explained this heretofore chaotic world to me. And uh, I'm going to read a, a brief quote for our listeners from your work, uh, from your autobiography, My Realizations. Only by retaining the knowledge of the search for his inner stars, it, from where the outer gross matter projects an illusory, illusory form, will white European man retain any mastery over outer stars. Uh, and as an astrologer, you spend considerable time, I'm sure, observing the skies. And this is something I think most people don't do these days. They don't contemplate the heavens and see the glory of God, as, as you said earlier in the psalmist says in the Bible. So what role can you see astrology playing in uh, Western man? And particularly the European man uh, finding his or refinding his destiny. Well, first I want to say, Paul, that the material prosperity of Western man is founded upon his spiritual rectitude in the past. And the more he loves God and pursues purity in God, the more the material world will go right for him. Things will be on his side that way. But the more he turns to lust, and the material world itself, the less will be 
is scientific advantages. All our virtues come from the religious virtue of our ancestors. I don't think there's really anything out there worth pursuing. But when God blesses us through loving God best, he gives us all the good things, and they're just details. They're just happenstance. By touching God within, mankind will have what he needs. White European man will have what he needs materially, and he'll prosper again materially. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess part of it is the to be appreciative of this, he has to re regain contact as well with his his subconscious mind, so he can you know be appreciative of. Well, through sorrows, he's doing that. He's seeing how much he's lost. He's seeing how weak he is. He's seeing how he's being ruled by a, a covert government. He sees how he's been invaded. White man is at a low state right now. He'd better think. He'd better think serious thoughts how he got there. He better claim God again. And uh, you you talk also about seeking God as an essential, uh, basically, reality within oneself. And basically, we see a lot of people, and I see this just in a lot of good people I know really have lost faith in any kind of God. So you talk about this God as a reality within oneself. Well, there's so many definitions of, of God. When someone's not sure if God exists, I say, well, some of the Hindu systems describe God as bliss. I know bliss exists. In fact, I feel bliss now. I know God exists. <laughs> Other systems say God is the sense of I, the sense of I-ness, or consciousness itself. We swim in consciousness like fish in water. I know consciousness. I'm aware right now. So by that, defi- by that definition of God, God exists. The people need examples. The people need lights. They need good men and women to arise, seek God and touch God themselves, then teach them the truth that brings joy, brings salvation, brings freedom from limitations and curses okay and uh, we have about uh, one minute remaining uh, basically I think this is a very positive note to go out out with I've uh, had a very positive uh, uh, you know view of your your works and I've really uh, been influenced uh, very uh, very positively by them over a period of time, and I highly recommend your sites to our readers. I'm going to list them. Uh, it's uh, celibacy.info, myrealizations.com, uh, whiteid.com, in cogland.com, and at YouTube, youtube.com, Divine Fellowship. And uh, once again, I'd like to uh, thank you for being on the show this evening, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, we uh, we certainly enjoyed having you, and uh, I hope that your words uh, will have had some impact on our listeners as they've had on me this evening. Great. And, uh, we'll talk I'd again like then. Wish, wish you a good evening and a good week. Okay, good night.
When you have car trouble, friends and family are always there. AAA won't replace them, but it can help you help them with road service in any car, even if you're a passenger. Join today and get a free Utes or Cougs roadside flashlight. Just tap the banner to sign up for AAA membership. Offer good through December 31st, 2016. One flashlight per household while supplies last. Certain restrictions apply. When you have car trouble, friends and family are always there. AAA won't replace them, but it can help you help them. With road service in any car, even if you're a passenger. Join today and get a free Utes or Cougs roadside flashlight. Just tap the banner to sign up for AAA membership. Offer good through December 31st, 2016. One flashlight per household while supplies last. Certain restrictions apply.